Now, there's a lot of detailed science that began to develop around this time, and I don't have time tonight to go into all of it, but suffice it to say that one of the key developments that also occurred around this time was the rise of computer modeling, the development of computer models to simulate the oceans and atmospheres in order to test what would happen to the atmosphere given the rise of CO2 that Killing was measuring. So we have a measurement, an observation, a fact, if you like, that CO2 is increasing, and then a theoretical analysis of what that increase in CO2 might actually mean. And with the rise of computer modeling, a consensus began to emerge in the 1970s that given the steady rise of CO2 that Keeling had observed and measured, that sooner or later global warming would occur. So I sometimes like to say that the consensus about global warming occurred in phases. The first phase was a consensus that it could occur, and the second question was whether or not it actually was occurring. This consensus was expressed by numerous different scientific organizations, including the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, who in 1979 declared, quote, a plethora of studies from diverse sources indicates a consensus that climate changes will result from man's combustion of fossil fuels and changes in land use. And again here we see early on a recognition the issue is not just greenhouse gases, that's important, but we also see this issue of land use being raised as well. The big question then was when. So scientists agreed that this was bound to happen sooner or later, but how soon or how much later? Most scientists writing in the 1970s thought that actual changes, discernible changes, were probably fairly far off in the future. No one knew for sure, but dates like 2030, 2040, 2050 were being bandied about. So the surprising answer was just a few years later. In 1988, so 11 years after the National Academy of Sciences report, climate modeler Jim Hansen published a major paper in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, about which he also testified in Congress that summer, declaring that he and his team were 99% sure that climate change caused by human activities, greenhouse gases and land use changes, was now detectable. Now, when Hansen testified in Congress in 1988, Many of his scientific colleagues thought he had gone out on a limb. Many of them thought he had gone too far to say that he was 99% sure that climate change was detectable. But they also agreed that the question was a very important one. And so it was this disturbing evidence that led to the creation in 1988 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So there's been a lot of news and the, there was a lot of press this year about the IPCC, a lot of criticisms, a lot of allegations about potential mistakes. But how many people ever stop to say, well, who are the IPCC and why do we even have an IPCC? And the answer is, well, because we've known since 1988 that the climate was perhaps already changing. And scientists and politicians understood at that time that we needed an organization, an objective scientific organization, to evaluate that scientific evidence. And that's exactly what the IPCC has done since 1988. It also led, in 1988, to an introduction into Congress of several bills to address the question, including the U.S. National Energy Policy Act, quote, to establish a national energy policy to reduce the generation of carbon dioxide and trace gases as quickly as is feasible in order to slow the pace and degree of atmospheric warming. So again, we see a recognition of the problem, and we see the beginnings of a suggestion of a potential political response. And in 1988 also, the New York Times said, quote, the issue of an overheating world has suddenly moved to the forefront of public concern. So we see this emerging scientific consensus. We see emerging political concern. We see the emergence of an organization whose purpose is to summarize and understand the scientific evidence. And we see members of Congress and the mass media recognizing this as not just a scientific issue, but a political, social, and economic issue as well. But at the very same time that this was happening, we also see the emergence of a political challenge to that scientific evidence. And that political challenge took the form of a campaign to cast doubt on the science and to claim that there was no consensus and that we didn't really know what was going on. The campaign focused on the claim that the science was unsettled and that therefore it would be premature for governments to take action about global warming. And I'm a historian, so I'm always interested in the origins of things. Where do things come from? Why did things develop the way they did? And so in this project, Eric Conway and I tried to figure out where this claim had come from. And we found that the origins of the claim could actually be traced back to a small handful of people. Some people who have read the book sometimes say, 
I don't know, it's hard to believe that three or four people can have so much impact. And I say, well, Adam and Eve created the human race. <laughs> now, today, there are attacks on climate science from many quarters. But one of the most important for a long period of time, going back to 1988, going back to this critical period, is an organization called the George C. Marshall Institute, a think tank based in Washington, DC. For many years, the Marshall Institute has denied the reality of global warming or insisted that if there were warming, it was not caused by human activities. It was just natural variation. As recently as 2007, the Institute quoted Timothy Ball, a Canadian climatologist, arguing that the widely propagated fact that humans are contributing to global warming is, quote, the greatest deception in the history of science. More recently, the Marshall Institute no longer denies the fact of global warming, but they continue to try to cast doubt on the reality of climate science. So recently they wrote, quote, many of the temperature data and computer models used to predict climate change are uncertain, as are our understandings of important interactions in the natural climate. Reducing these many uncertainties requires a significant shift in the way climate change research is carried out in the US and elsewhere. Now, this is a very sophisticated and subtle claim because, of course, the first part of it is correct. Many of the temperature data and computer models are uncertain. Anything involving prediction of the future is, by definition, uncertain. But the implication that there's somehow something wrong with climate science, that somehow we need to change the way the science has done, is intended to cast doubt on whether or not the science is reliable. So where did the Marshall Institute come from? Who are these people, and why do they cast doubt on the reliability of climate science? Well, it turns out the Marshall Institute was founded by three men, all physicists who had been active in Cold War weapons and rocketry programs, who had come to prominence in the 1950s and 60s because of their work on the Manhattan Project, on the hydrogen bomb, on the early space program, and who had known each other for many years um, and shared many of the same convictions and beliefs. On the left here, Robert Jastrow, an astrophysicist who was head of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies and an early <coughs> pioneer in the space program. On the right, this man, William Nuremberg, a nuclear physicist and the longtime director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, and in the middle, Frederick Seitz, a president of the US National Academy of Sciences and one time president of the Rockefeller University. So all extremely distinguished scientists with very powerful and solid scientific bona fides, although none of them climate scientists, none of them experts on environmental or health issues. In the early 1980s, these three men found themselves working together on, on an advisory panel to the Reagan administration on the question of strategic defense, or what many of us know of as Star Wars. In 1984, they created the Marshall Institute to defend SDI against a scientist boycott. Now, some of you will remember that when Ronald Reagan proposed Star Wars, it was extremely controversial. It was controversial for a number of reasons, but above all, because it was a rapid and rather startling departure from what had been US and Soviet policy throughout the Cold War since 1945, which was the policy of mutual assured destruction. That is to say, both the Soviet Union and the United States were committed to having large, powerful nuclear arsenals on the premise that so long as each side knew that a first strike launched by one side would lead to a retaliatory strike by the other, and both sides would be obliterated, there was no incentive to start a third world war. And that policy, that concept of mutual assured destruction, was credited both at the time and now by historians as well with keeping the peace throughout the Cold War and preventing nuclear Armageddon. But SDI challenged that assumption, because if one side thought that they could launch a first strike, and be protected from retaliation by a missile shield, then that side, in this case the United States, might be tempted to launch a preemptive attack. And the whole balance of power of the Cold War would come crumbling down. So because of this, the vast majority of American scientists, as well as many other people as well, opposed SDI as potentially destabilizing, potentially actually leading to the very war that it was intended to avoid.